movements of peoples and what it's going to mean. I think sometimes we assume, um, you know, we're 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 the kind of planners who are thinking about managed retreat and we're thinking about, you know, um, almost genteel things and such. And I think, you know, as um, you know, as some of Todd's work has illustrated. Um, uh, there, there are aspects of this that aren't very genteel um, uh, on many sides. So um, at, at any rate, um, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to listen. And Todd, um, take it away. Thanks so much. And hi, Todd. Just a quick, uh, it looks like you're muted. So I'm going to unmute you, which will be important for your presentation. And then if you want to share your screen, you should be able to do that. I don't know if you have any visual aids or, or not. Oh, no, sorry. That's okay. No. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, that we can oh, hear good. You. All right. All right, great. All right, sounds great. Um, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, uh, I imagine you, just to, just to make sure, we're going to talk, you want me to maybe talk for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll go into a discussion after that. Is that correct? Okay. Um, well, I, I'll just jump right into it then. I'm, um, as Patrick just mentioned, I'm a journalist. Um, I am, I, and I've been one of the main subjects that I've been covering is borders. But um, one of my books was looking at the borders, the idea of borders and connecting that with climate change. And, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit right now. And um, so I was thinking um, how to go into this and I, I think maybe best to uh, it might be best just to share a story and as, and and the story that I want to share um is of a young man he was 18 or 19 years old who I met in on the US Mexico border in the small town of Sasave uh, last summer and I met him while um he had attempted to cross the US border and he did not make it so he was back on the Mexican side and I was talking to him as he was having his feet bandaged by um, by an emergency medical technician, and I was helping out with translation, and so um, so as just to, his feet were pretty bad because he'd been walking for almost two days in the desert, so they're very blistered, and the blisters are broken up, and you could see like the red kind of tender flesh underneath the feet, and you could see his and one of his I remember distinctly that one of his toenails was ripped off. And, um, and he told me about the journey. I'll, I'll talk, talk about that in a second. But he also um, uh, started talking about what, why he was going. And um, uh, well, first he was going to meet his, his, he had two brothers in Dallas, Texas. So he was hoping to meet up with them. So that was his intention. But um, he was coming from a place called San Cristobal La Frontera in Guatemala. And that's right on the border with El Salvador. And he said, he, he looked at me and he asked me, have you ever heard of the dry corridor? And we were talking in Spanish. He said, have you ever heard of the dry corridor? And I'm like, yeah, of course I've heard of the dry corridor. And the dry corridor is, you know, the, quite a big and actually growing swath of territory in Central America, which ranges from Guatemala through Honduras, El Salvador, even as far as Nicaragua. And I've heard some people say Panama and as, as north as southern Mexico, um, where there's been intensifying droughts. Um, and so I said, yes, I've, I've, I've heard of it. And he said, well, we, well that's where I'm, I live, right in the middle of what is known as the dry corridor. Um, and, and he told me it hadn't rained for, for 40 days um, where he lived. And... Um, that the crops were wilting, the milpas, they call them the milpas in the area, of the corn fields, uh, corns and beans and squash, the crops were not, there was no harvest. And thus, that's why, um, that's why um, he was heading north. That was one of the main reasons. And um, so when you look at um, like the data uh, a couple months later, and that was April of this year, uh, the World Food Program came out with an estimate of people impacted by the different droughts and intensifying weather situations in Central America, especially in, in the dry corridor. And um, the World Food Program, uh, the estimate was 2 million people affected um, by both, both droughts and, and, um, and the other extreme of extreme precipitation. And according to their data, 1.4 million people 
were put into a food crisis. Um, and I don't know if people saw some of, there's um, quite a bit of coverage of, of um, people who died in U.S. custody um, earlier in this year. And one of them was a young man named Juan Gutierrez. And he was actually from the dry corridor as well. And one of his main reasons was he had the coffee plant fields where he was working. There, there was no rain and they couldn't um, harvest. So he actually died in, in, um, in U.S. custody. Um, so you know, the, it's hard to tell like with, with climate and the change in climate exactly how it's impacting people, right? But you can look at certain numbers and, and put it into a broader analysis of um, different things that are happening in different places, such, such as like the highlands of Guatemala or where Juan Gutierrez or where um, Giovanni were, were, are from are very poor places. So if, if the harvests don't come, there's not much cash to back you up and that, that could potentially put you into a crisis. But also the droughts um, talking to, to um, the intensifying droughts in these areas, talking to climate scientists. And obviously I'm not one myself, I'm a journalist, but um, I did interview climate scientists doing modeling in, um, in Central America. And in my research, I actually went, you know, I looked at different places, but I'm just gonna focus on Central America for today. And um, this, uh, one of the climate scientists uh, named Chris Castro, he's a hydrologist from the University of Arizona. He said, he said well, if you look at um, climate change in um, Central America is quote unquote ground zero for the Americas. Um, and what, what, he, what, he, what he meant by that was that the kind of drought situations, the scrambling of seasons, the inconsistency of, of rain, or the fact that people are planting and then the rains don't come is becoming more intensified, the rest weather less reliable, and it's causing more and more havoc. But he, he also meant it wasn't only the droughts. When you look at Central America, you're looking at an isthmus, and of course, there's gigantic bodies of water on either side where huge storms have spun off hurricanes. Like Hurricane Mitch is one of the, one of the um, really vivid examples of that, and which is, you know, unleashed, you know, the sorts of the sort of weather like landslides and mudslides and flooding. And, and so that, you know, you have a combination of too much precipitation or no precipitation at all. And that's, um, according to Castro and other climate scientists doing modeling, having an impact. Now, again, it's, it's you know, you have to look at a m multiple factors and people, I'm, I've talked to people who are wary about, you know, saying, oh, climate change is, you know, the cause of, of you know, but, but to like, on the other hand, to say that it's not having an exacerbating effect or not having a huge impact is also um, not seeing the situation as it's playing out. Um, but what is the impact? That's, that's what's the dif difficult to deduce. Um, there are some numbers, I'm, I'm assuming that people here among us are probably aware of those, of some of these numbers, but like the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center um, calculated between 2008 and 2015 and, and a global level that 22.5 million people per year are being displaced for climate related reasons. Um, and uh, and um, the, the kind of forecasts for, for people being displaced in the future are pretty wide ranging and pretty dramatic. And so if you look for two, at 2050, you have predictions ranging from about 140 million to a, a 1 billion people um, who possibly will be displaced as, as one of the dr big drivers being climate change. And that's that again, sea level rise, droughts, extreme weather, um, all the different impacts that, that everyone knows so much about. And, um, and so while those numbers, again, are very widely debated and there, there's not necessarily a consensus, on, and of course we're talking about the future, and of course there's so many things that can be done between now and then, and of course there's many mitigation efforts that can happen and resiliency and adaptation and, and, and all of that. But um, um, so it's an unknown, right? But talking to some of the researchers that have been connecting climate with migration and, and displacement. Um, they say if things stay the same, what we'll see is going to be, as one researcher put it, is going to be quote unquote staggering 
and without precedent in human history as far as people being on the move. Um, and so what, so that's uh, one, one of the aspects that I, I looked into when I was looking in the book, Storming the Wall, um, which looked at climate change, migration, and, and borders. And um, so what happens is that when people are displaced, oftentimes, uh, you know, people stay close to home or the, migrate, the kind of migration that will happen will be within a country or people from rural areas will move to cities and that sort of thing. But increasingly, it could be like, what you hear a lot in Honduras, for example, is that people move to Tegucigalpa or to San Pedro Sula, maybe try to get a factory job, but if things are so unstable in those areas, then you go, you head north from there. There's many different trajectories that, that people can take. Um, but as soon as we go to the point where people are crossing borders, then we have, have um, the situation where really, really there's no climate refugee status in the world. There's no, um, the re you know, the internet, you know, from the, in the international perspective, the definition of refugee does not include those displaced due to climate change. There's not um, statuses in individual countries, though there's variations that can be interpreted a little bit, but there's really no climate refugee status. One exception to the rule might be New Zealand, and I'm not sure if this is passed or not, so if people know this, they might pipe in, but, um, I, New Zealand was going to offer a status for um, for Pacific Islanders who were suffering from sea level rise, and and offer like a hundred or two hundred or three hundred. I can't remember how many per year. Um, I'm not sure if that legislation has passed or not, uh, but it's if that passes, it's it's it, it's not you know for a, a world that's predicted to have massive amounts of people on the move. It's still very small you know but it could serve as a model um for other countries it could serve as a maybe there's a domino effect maybe new zealand will add more people i don't know but that's one one uh exception um but what most people if they cross borders and they don't have papers and that's the third thing that i really have been looking into is borders and border regimes um and if you look um, again, if it, so, in a, in a way, I, the one my research has been doing is looking at trends. So going from oh, there's increased impacts of climate change going to the present and predicted if things stay the same into the future. Oh, there's increased displacement due to climate change increasing into the present and then predicted to get even bigger going in the future. The same for border systems. Uh, they they've been growing going into the present and and predicted to increase going into the future. And one one of the biggest examples of this is just the how many border walls across the world there are. When the Berlin Wall fell in in 1989 there were 15 uh border walls and um the last tabulation I saw from there's a professor from the University of Montreal um in Quebec or the University of Quebec Montreal who who counts border wells around the world and her last tabulation was 77. Um, so it went from 15 to 77, two thirds of those have been constructed in the post 9-11 era. And really that's, um, you, you can look at the US border in, in much of the same light. It's, it's, it's very much um, increased in enforcement over the last 25 years. Very much, I mean, obviously with the Trump administration, there's, there's an emphasis put on it, but it's been predating the Trump administration. There's been pretty massive increases of US border enforcement and like if you look at the board budgets for border and immigration enforcement in 2000 or 1994 it was 1. 1.5 billion and 2018 it's 23 billion dollars so it's almost a 15 fold increase um and that translates many ways border patrol agents have gone from 4000 to 21000 and that was before the Trump took office. It was 2012 when agents reach, reached 21,000. Um, there's 650 to 700 miles of walls and barriers on the U.S.-Mexico border already. And that's really the situation that Giovanni, the, the, the young man from Guatemala who I met, was in. Right? The, the, the whole strategy in the U.S. border has been what they call prevention through deterrence. So you cut off the, the, what would be the traditional places where people would cross, like urban areas, and then people then, if they continue to cross, they circumvent those areas and go into places like near where I live. I live in Tucson, Arizona, and near where I live in the, in the Arizona desert. And 
that's exactly what Giovanni and many others um, were doing the day I met him when, when the emergency medical technician was bandaging his feet. He had walked, I think it was, if I can remember correctly, I'm not to remember, but like 48 hours into the desert. Um, like many, he didn't carry, he was, it's almost impossible to carry enough water. So he ran out of water and his feet started to hurt and his shins started to hurt. And eventually he just left his group. So his group was like five or six people and he left to go back. And he's actually, when somebody loses their group in the desert, the odds of them dying are pretty high. There's been more than 8,000 remains found in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands since since uh, <clears throat> the mid-1990s. And so for Giovanni to have made his way back to the to get back to Mexico was actually kind of a miracle that he was sitting there getting his feet bandaged. Um, but that's all part of the that's part of the design of the border was is that it becomes really difficult to cross and even deadly. Um, and so and so that's, uh, you know, an example of what might meet like people in situations like Giovanni um, from Central America as they cross the U.S. Mexico border that are, you know, that that climate intensifying changing factors then lead to this kind of, you know, the displacement, migration, and, and running into borders that can be really difficult to cross. Um, and for, and as, as I wrap up, I want to um, uh, mention there is, um, or maybe I'll just, uh, I'm seeing that I, I don't want to talk too much, so I might abbreviate this part. But uh, the, looking at um, the, like, um, there's different climate adaptation climate papers that have come out through Department of Homeland Security, through the Pentagon over the years. Um, climate change has been uh, identified as a national security threat. Um, and you look at some, like some of the droughts, the, the, there's a, an awareness of, of the drought-like situations, for example, that Giovanni was facing in Central America, even in the papers of DHS. But the way that DHS is geared and at least in the border enforcement part of it is to look at it like either you have papers or you don't have papers to be able to cross a border and again there's no sort of climate refugee status and um so is that so then it leaves you the question here in 2019 where we are like what sort of um you know what sort of sort of future are we looking at it you know again as things stay the same um predicted are going to be more people on the move impacted due to climate situations. More people are predicted to, if more people are on the move, most likely there's gonna be more people um, crossing borders. There's more border borders being all over, you know, being put up all over the world. And um, actually I'm gonna leave it with one, I wanna leave with um, one other like kind of alternative image that I looked at. Um, and that was actually also on the US-Mexico border and has to do with a water harvesting project. And it happened right, right, uh, like kind of near where I met Giovanni. But if you go to the, if you go to the east, maybe 100 and 150 miles, there's a binational water harvesting project. And the reason why I want to point this out is one is binational, so it has this kind of cross cross border organization. Two, it's a water harvesting project, and it was one of the really kind of striking things about it was that you can see the water harvesting project happen right on the border. So you can actually see the border barrier. You can see a new surveillance tower coming up. Um, you can see border patrol agents on the, on the U.S. side, but it's on the Mexico side. And on the Mexico side, what, what people are doing are putting what are called gabions, which I'm assuming that some people here would be familiar with, which is basically big steel mess, mesh um, cages filled with rocks. And the whole idea is you put them in dry river beds like Silver Creek, where I where where I was where I was watching it, and that when the monsoon rains come, like in Arizona in the summer, water rushes um, through the washes, and then what the gabions do is slow them down, and then the 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 soil can then absorb the water. And it was interesting watch this watch this play out like right on the border. And when I was doing it, my guides when I went to it was as a project known as Cuenca Los Ojos, and my guides took me to a place where actually the water, the monsoon waters had washed uh, part of the U.S.-Mexico border wall um, barrier, I should say, uh, a quarter mile inland to Mexico. So it was actually being devoured by the planet. Um, it was like, it had been there for over a year and there was like um, 
purple flowers on it and it was taken been taken over by spider webs and that sort of thing but you could also see at the same time these you know this kind of this, these gabions that almost showed like a tale of two walls like they almost look like intricately carved stone wall against the the border barrier itself so it's like wow i mean i know it might not be that simple but there's there's like two options right there right and and the and the gabions the the guides are showing me how that how it you know the desert grasses are growing back the the um desert willows are growing back there's animals coming back and then they told me the most they said and the water table here and mind you one of the climate prognostications what we're seeing in arizona and northern mexico is drought right the lack of rain and there's parts of arizona and this part is part of one of those parts of arizona where serious drought has happened and water tables have been going down and then they told me well the, the water table and their little subregion had gone up 30 feet and i was like wow that's that's a miracle and they said no it's not a miracle we're just piling up rocks and um so i asked like the people in the in in the cuenca los ojos what could you do with it at the time the border and immigration budget that we saw also saw before our eyes with the border wall and the, and the surveillance tower that was 20 billion dollars i said what could you do with 20 billion dollars and then they began to like talk about places I, I i made the mistake of not putting on my recorder so i didn't get exactly what they said exactly <laughs> but they started talking about places so far away that that it made me think you know whoa you know what like when we really think about security which is you know when you think about borders it's like border security right when you're thinking about security and you're thinking about the future isn't there like some other things we could be really thinking about and and what if more money were actually put into these um you know, like in this case, a water harvesting project, we're in a place where there's a severe drought and where assessments, when you look at some of the Pentagon assessments actually about, you know, people in Northern Mexico, one of the things they always mention is water scarcity. So, so the idea that, you know, there's, there, there's different possibilities, right, out there that, that we could follow. And, and with that, I will be quiet. Wow, thank you. That was a, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I learned a, learned a lot, and um, yeah, that was, was awesome. Uh, so, uh, questions? Does um, does anybody have questions? I know I have a couple, but I want to wait a bit and give everybody else a chance. So, Mark North Cross here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Great. Um, I didn't have a chance to introduce myself, but Todd set up my my introduction and my question perfectly. Uh, NHA Advisors, Mill Valley, California, having a bowl of ramen. But uh, we do, we finance public infrastructure, which means that we have to find ways to get people to pay for things. And the key word that applies just where Todd was wrapping up, great presentation, is avoided costs. So when you want to get the public to pay for something that they really don't want to pay for, one way to sell it is to point out that you're already paying this much money to react to the problem. Instead, you could treat that as an avoided cost and pay this much money and address the problem, make it go away. And so the question that comes up on this form of manage retreat, or it sounds like manage abandonment from Central America is how much is the United States paying to address this immigration for climate change and how does that compare to what it would take for us to go down and do exactly what Todd was talking about in the uh, Gabion, if I pronounced it right, project, other projects to help the people in Central America in the drought impacted areas address that drought so they could stay there and live there. <clears throat> and that's the avoided cost concept. It works whether you're trying to get a sales tax increase to do a, a freeway interchange or I'm hoping it would work in the case of climate change refugees as well. So thank you, Todd. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your um, very pertinent question. Um, yeah, I mean, what, like, that's, that was essentially what I was trying to um, get at when I, when I asked the, one of the, at the very end, when I asked the, one of the founders of the Cuenca Los Ojos project, uh, what could you do with $20 billion, right? Um, and that was just for like the yearly budget that was going to 
like what it, I mean, it doesn't even have to be 20 billion. What could you do with 1 billion, right? What, like when you look at the, when you look at these, the border and immigration f- budgets, they just increased and increased and increased and increased and increased, right? Since they were 1.5 billion in 1994 or 4.2 billion in 2000 or 14 billion in 2010, they keep increasing. They, that's, so why not stop them increasing and use that money for other potential things like you mentioned? I mean, it doesn't even have to be that big of a radical change um, if, if, if you want to look at it practically. Or maybe, it's, maybe it could be a bigger radical change, you know? Um, maybe it would lead to uh, new ways to really cons- to think about security, what security is, and how to address security. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, so this is Patrick. Um, I guess I, I, uh, this brings to mind two quotes. One's from William Gibson, the novelist, and said, um, the future is already here, but not evenly distributed. And then the other one is by Yogi Berra, which is something like, predictions are hard, especially about the future. So in that sort of spirit, I mean, I, I wonder, and I, I've read some things, and I, I've, connecting, you know, the sort of the rise of global autocracy and authoritarianism in a lot of countries to, you know, increasing pressures on immigration. You sort of see some of this in the European Union right now. Um, you see it in a lot of places. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to that. And, you know, what is your sort of feeling? I mean, uh, Judging from what you've seen, um, is there a, is is that is that a reasonable thing to say that there might be um, sort of the, uh, a bit of a connection between the f- increasing flows of people and sort of the react the sort of reaction we're seeing? And if so, I don't know where, where do you where do you feel we may be we may be going? You mean in terms of like the kind of border ap- approach? Is that what you mean? I- I think in general, I think also it's also, you know, the, the border, especially in the past years, you know, it's been, I know it's happened in the Obama administration, but it's been intensified in terms of like what's going on and sort of like the, even beyond that, the sort of um, use of migrants as sort of a, almost like a prop or an excuse to um, say, you know, we, we need more power to deal with them and such. And it seems to happen in a lot of places. So I'm just kind of wondering your feelings on that. Yeah, I, I th- I think, I mean, again, like, you know, I, I want to stress the Yogi Berra code part of it. And again, the future is, un, it's hard to predict the future, but you can, you can definitely look at dynamics, right? And you can definitely look at dynamics and how they've been coming into the present and then make educated guesses. Um, and it seems like there's a cor- correlation. Um, there's the, the um, uh, there's plenty of assessments um, that are, you know, there's a, a Pentag- I was going to read a Pentagon is um, based uh, a Pentagon commissioned uh, report, uh, just a little excerpt, which um, which really correlates what it's actually an abrupt. It was looking at an abrupt uh, or a worst case scenario in a climate situation, and this is a 2003 Pentagon report. And one part of it is, you know, they they identify the United States and Australia as as having to build up defensive fortresses, they use the word defensive fortresses. And then they say to stop and then quote unquote, unwanted starving immigrants, unquote, coming from, in the US case from, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean part, you know, which should resonate with everyone, they put an especially severe problem, as we can see with the Bahamas, as we can see in, you know, different scenarios in, the, in Puerto Rico, or in, of course, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, but in, in different scenarios that we've seen and that's happened in the Caribbean. So this idea of, um, of like, um, a future of, of um, you know, that, uh, of immigration, um, the, one, of the, one of the reports I looked at was called the Climatic Cataclysm, and that was, um, from, it was a, a U.S. Congress mandated report where they looked at different temperature scenarios in the future, and they looked at um, at uh, and they looked at uh, like forty years in the future, and then uh, then like seventy five years in the future, I believe, with different temperature scenarios. And one of the one of the points they stressed when they looked at their assessments, and all almost all the assessments had immigration involved, displacement, people on the move, lots of people on the move in some cases and border systems being built up more and more. And one of the things that they made clear, you know, right from the get-go and throughout the whole report was that for a national security planner to plan, they have to look 30 years into the future to plan for that, for what's going to happen that much in the future. So this idea in the future, if this is what scientists are saying, is this is what 
you know, people are saying of as far as people being displaced, this is what people are saying with people possibly being on the move, then the sort of from the national security perspective then comes, you know, this idea of building up or preparing for such situations. And you can see that in the different assessments. So, <laughs> yeah, and in that, in that sense, again, I, it's really important to go back to the, the Yogi Berra quote because all this could potentially shift in, in major ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It seems like the planet's going to have to really look at, a, you know, a situation where more people are going to be on the move and, and um, maybe there's different ways to really think that out. And, you know, there's going to be places that are going to be uninhabitable. And what about that? What about like coastal cities that are not going to, you're, you're they're going to be flooded or, or are, can they be, can that be mitigated? Or is there, you know, what, what are, what are different ways we can think about mobility? Because one of the big ways that are being thought about it right now is again, this idea of some per people are included and others are excluded and um, some there, and, and there's these border systems, but I'm, I think that possibly we can think of something different. Hey, Patrick, this is Deborah. I have a question for um, Todd. I don't know. You, oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. It's more of a comment, though, but um, I just want to remind everybody that the United States doesn't have any protection for its own citizens who um, are displaced or who have to migrate because of environmental circumstances. Um, I was on the Gulf Coast during Katrina, and at that time, there was increased security and detention for people around the Gulf Coast as they moved from state to state, depending on who you were and what you were driving. So <clears throat> the, um, the notion that um, people aren't afraid of strangers wherever they come from is very high after a disaster and that there's no um, national identification or any way for people who don't have driver's licenses or credit cards to be recognized as citizens when they cross state borders either. So um, until uh, the United States starts to invest, uh, not that there should be an either war, but until this country starts to invest protections for its own citizens, it's highly unlikely that they'll do anything for um, or set up any kind of protocols for people who migrate from other places. Yeah, th uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I, I remember when I looked into Katrina, there's um, a big uh, border patrol operation that happened in Katrina <laughs> um, where, or at least there was border patrol that went to, um, you know, and, and uh, were, you know, in the streets with the National Guard in some places, which, um, I mean, I think a part of, uh, you know, the idea, your point that you're making, the, the kind of um, upheavals and um, what's happening, it's, it, and, and obviously it's not just going to happen in other places, it's definitely happening in the United States and it's going to cause people to move from one place to another. And, and there are tons of domestic issues, um, really huge ones. And um, it's almost like, I don't, but I don't, like the kind of the, in a way, like the kind of mobility or the fact that people are going to have to be on the move on um, no matter where they're from, no matter if they're within country or from other countries is, is something really that the globe has to reckon with. It seems to me like, like in one way, the United, like as far as like its border and immigration enforcement, there's a lot of effort put into it. It's like maybe again, that money can be funneled into different things. Like partly maybe it could offer protect, you know, maybe that could be dedicated to protecting people, you know, instead of putting all that money into this, gigantic border apparatus. Maybe it could go into many other different programs um, or it could help people that are suffering from the impacts of, 
of whatever it is, the climate impacts, we'll say, in the United States. Or, I mean, there just seems to be much better ways to spend what, you know, the bill countless billions that are going into this, these um, these immigration and, and border enforcement programs that could be much better spent and much better for the well-being of all humanity. Hi, this is Dave. Quick question. Uh, I got a little quieter here in the cafe, so I can, maybe I can ask. Uh, do you have examples that you've come across of communities learning from each other, especially ones that have had to relocate, usually non-voluntarily, to other communities that might need to in the future? Um, so, hey, we went through this. You're going to be going through this, too, and here's what we recommend, especially uh, uh, indigenous groups. Thanks. Uh, um, mm, uh, no, I don't, let me think. Um, that's a very interesting question because I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that's very true. Though a lot of times, you know, communities will disperse, um, and then people will go to many different places. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I did not look into that. I think that would be a really interesting thing to look at the kind of, um, what I automatically think of is, is um, you know, that, that kind of organic solidarity that often happens between communities and, and um, where one community actually is showing is the potential future of another community and the kind of ways that people could come together. Um, but I don't know if I have any examples, at least off the top of my head when you ask the question right now, I, I can't think of it, but I imagine that those are out there. They'd be really interesting to look into. Yeah, and just to, Dave, I was about to read your question in the chat. Um, I thought it, it's a really interesting point to consider as well. And when Dave wrote in the question too, he specifically, you know, called out populations experiencing more rapid onset vulnerability, such as Pacific Islanders versus slower onset. And I think it will be really interesting to see how that plays out. And you know, considering that different populations are going to be experiencing this in much very different ways and at very different rates. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those populations that experience are the ones that are going to be, have the, probably some of the best knowledge of how to deal with it, right? So it's, that's a really important thing to look into, I think. Awesome. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, great. Well, it looks like that's all we've got. Todd, thank you so much. This has been just a really, really excellent presentation, very enlightening discussion. I think you've given us all a lot of food for thought. Um, I don't really have any other announcements for the group. I do want to mention that next month we're having David Casagrande from the Lehigh University. Um, he'll be joining us. He'll be discussing um, some qualitative research about um, people who have relocated um, in the Midwest and other, other areas and kind of looking at more of um, sort of the emotional response and such, which would be very interesting. He's also on Science Friday a couple weeks ago, along with our very own AR Siders as well. So definitely go and take a look at that. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. Um, Kelly and Ira, your, your uh, other, my other leadership co, um, co leaders here. Do you guys have any announcements you want to make? Okay. Sorry. Uh, hearing Sorry. Not. I was on oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. No, I don't think so at this time. Um, although I guess over the coming months, we will be sharing more information about um, maybe some opportunities for how to continue this particular educational group kind of outside or in partnership with some other um, organizations like the Climate Migration Network. So, um, and we haven't really talked about that super publicly, but I just wanted to pique people's interest and say look forward hopefully to some interesting conversations in the months ahead about that. 
Yeah, thank you, Kelly. I I totally neglected that. So thanks so much for doing that. Yeah, it's it's really preliminary now. Um, we still have to, you know, we're just kind of opening up these discussions ourselves. But we are thinking about the the next incarnation of that work once our year term is done. So, yeah, please stay tuned. Um, there should to be some interesting opportunities there and. Um, uh, news because I think this work is extremely valuable and I think you know we want to make sure we can institutionalize this in a, a way that's uh, uh, beneficial as many people as we can so um, yeah yeah and Patrick if I could just jump in with a semi related ASAP announcement just to make sure everyone is aware that we are now in the midst of looking ahead to 2020 member-led interest groups the application period for new groups is open for another approximately two, a little bit more than two weeks uh, to November 20th. So think about what groups you may want as members in the coming year. We're going to continue 2019 groups through March, but if you submitted a topic already, if you want to see the list of topics submitted, you could go to our website, or if you're really interested in exploring where one of the current groups could go and maybe interested in joining the leadership team, I would be happy to connect you with other members who have similar interests or current group leaders who are now having conversations like Patrick and Kelly were describing about where to go next with current groups. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's all I've got. Um, so I guess I will give everyone back eight minutes of their day. Um, Again, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, thank you everybody who joined us. It's been pre it's been it's been awesome, and um, can't wait to see as many any of you can make it next month. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Bye.